Hi again, everybody. Steve Scott here, and welcome to another online uh, coaching program that I call Kaizen. Uh, Mark Twain said there are lies, damn lies, and statistics, and uh, that's what we're going to cover today. We're not going to cover any lies or damn lies. I'm going to hope to hopefully cover a few statistics about judo matches and what happens in a judo match. We're going to kind of look at this. Now, my research has been done um, in... Uh, entirely in AAU judo and in AAU freestyle judo. So the rules, everything I'm, I'm going to talk to you about today is, is based on that. However, the rule set that we used in AAU, that we use in freestyle AAU judo is um, a very good mix of standing and ground. And I think anyone, whether you are an IJF or, or, or USA type, USA judo person, you might find these statistics useful. So, but again, I think the old saying, good judo is good judo, and I think that would be certainly the case here. But these do reflect how the rules of freestyle judo are written in the sense that we do have a, a very uh, uh, even split of standing and ground action in freestyle judo. You'll see when I bear out as I, as I talk about these more uh, today. So anyway, let's, let's get with it. Um, what we're going to cover is the wide gamut. Uh, of uh, the attack patterns and match time, the whole thing. Okay, first of all, my statistics come. Uh, I've been keeping them since about well, now. It's 2015. We're in we're in 2015, and I've been keeping them since 09, 2009. And I would not use these in, in a professional journal. However, for me, the statistics I've been keeping are good enough as a coach. They do give a a very to me accurate. Uh, indication of what actually happens in a judo match. So, whereas I wouldn't, you know, publish these in a professional journal, um, but I, I would use them um, in in a uh, as a coach for my benefit and the benefit of my my athletes. And I hope you can use these statistics as well. So again, they're not like super scientific, but they're really accurate. And I've kept uh, hundreds of judo matches. Okay, so. I am a geek on this stuff, and I've been doing this type of thing ever since I was a young coach. I was in the habit of coming home, uh, looking at the notes I kept during a, a tournament and compiling them and then studying them and then using those notes to see how I could better coach my athletes. Well, um, here we go. It's the same type of thing. Hopefully, you can use the information I've garnered here uh, with this and, and, and use it in a positive way for your athletes as well if you're a coach or if you're an athlete, use this information for your own training. Okay, so the, the what I did here is over this period of time, I selected uh, males and in the senior category. Now, I'm not being a, um, uh, you know, um, anti-women judo or anything else or anti-junior judo or anti-masters or veterans judo. It's just that there were more male judo matches in freestyle and AAU judo that I, that I studied than the others. And I might also add that with we... We don't have that large of a population of females in freestyle or AAU judo that I could keep what I felt were uh, what I believed were to be uh, as accurate statistics as I liked. Um, so I use the males in the senior categories. OK, so that being said, uh, we have a lot more males doing AAU judo and freestyle judo than, than females. So that's really why I did this. It was more for accuracy. Uh, and in juniors, uh, juniors are still learning. They're still developing. Uh, I mean, we, we could do something on juniors. If you, if, you know, if someone wanted to do that, go ahead and do that. I didn't. Uh, and same with the veterans or masters. Um, I thought males were a good indication of what's going on in the sport. And I, I had so many of them and it was a good, uh, a good study group to use. Um, so let's get at it. Okay. 64 and a half percent of the time, almost 65% of the time, the first athlete to attack wins the match. That's that happens. And I think that's generally that's what I always heard about 60 percent of the time. The first person to attack wins. Well, same here. So we have it. it we, you know, I've been keeping stats on this. So 64 and a half percent of the time, first guy to attack first guy. Well, first guy to attack wins the match. OK, the average match length. Now, remember, five minute matches in freestyle judo. OK, that's five minute. You know, that's the length of the match. OK, in the two minute overtime. Uh, the first score to win over time, but it could go up to two minutes uh, if it is a five-minute match. But five-minute scheduled match, the average match, match length in the seven different weight classes that I studied was 2.43 2 seconds. So almost, well, 
43 seconds, two, two minutes and 43, two, four, four, three seconds. Isn't that great? Two minutes and 43 seconds. Boy, there you go. Okay, so two minutes, 43 seconds is the average match length in a freestyle judo match. Breaking that down. Before I break it down, I think, now again, these are based on national matches, generally, uh, and some very high level regional competitions, but mostly national statistics. Now, the IJF keeps stats, very good ones, and their average match length is, the last I read it, and I might be totally wrong now, but about three minutes, 30 seconds. And that was at the international level. My statistics are at the national level. Okay, so if you kept, if it looked, I don't know if USA Judo keeps stats on this. Uh, I'm not privy to them. I, I haven't even tried to look at them. They may be out there. But if they do, they may be somewhat similar to what we're doing in freestyle in terms of statistics, or they may be closer to the international thing of three and a half minutes. Don't know. But there are reasons for this because the way the rules are written, the way the referees conduct the match, um, uh, you know, different. Uh, the, like I said, the way the rules are written, we see about a 50 50 split of standing and ground fighting in freestyle judo, where you see predominantly standing uh, uh, throwing techniques in, in IJF. And also it's the international level. So they may be more cautious at that level and not wanting to make a mistake. It could be, could be the, don't know, but it could be those factors. So we're seeing a little bit different. Okay. And, and between what we're doing, what my stats are and what the IJF may be doing. So a little bit different there, different, different match lengths for different body weight categories or different, different weight classes. In the 145 pound class, the average match time is three minutes, 29 seconds. In the 155 pound class, three minutes, 11 seconds. In the 165 pound class, two minutes, 41 seconds. In the 178 pound class, three minutes flat. Okay. In the 190 pound class, two minutes, 23 seconds. In the 210 pound class, two minutes, 45 seconds. And in the heavyweights, I combined anything over 210, the two heavyweights, and also any open. No, I didn't combine open. It was just the heavier weight, the heavier weight men. Um, two minutes and 53 seconds for the bigger guys. Okay. Now, um, the average time between standing attacks in all weight classes is 10.06 seconds. So slightly over, every 10 seconds, one athlete will attack another athlete with a, with a throw, a meaningful throw, not just kick at him to make the referee think you're doing something great. No, a meaningful attack, some type of, I, the guy actually tried to break the other one's balance and throw him. Okay. So every 10.06 seconds, the average time between ground fighting attacks is 11.6 seconds. So slightly under 12 seconds. Okay. So that's some interesting things about what's going on in a freestyle judo match, AAU matches. Uh, by weight classes, we can break them down. In the 145-pound class, every 6.7 seconds, one of the athletes will attack the other, okay? Standing, with a standing attack. Every 7.3 seconds in ground fighting, Nawaza, an attack occurs, okay, in the 145-pound class. 155, every 12.7 seconds, one athlete attacks another one with a throw. Every nine seconds in the 155 pound class, one, attack, one athlete will attack another one in some type of a ground fighting move. In the 165 pound class, a bit faster tempo standing, every 7.3 seconds, one athlete will attack the other. And in the 165 pound class, every 12 seconds, one athlete will make a meaningful attack on the other athlete. Every 12 seconds in Nawaza. In the 178 pound class, every 8.9 seconds, one, one opponent will attack the other one with a throw. And on the ground, in the 178 pound class, every 11.3 seconds, one athlete will attack another one with a meaningful Nawaza uh, attack. In the 190 pound class, every 10.8 seconds, one opponent will attack the other one with a throw. And every 11 seconds, one athlete will attack another one with a ground fighting attack. That's in 190. So it's pretty well spread there. It's, very, it's pretty much about every 11 seconds standing around the ground, those guys in the 190-pound class are attacking each other. In the 210-pound class, every 10.8 seconds, almost every 11 seconds, uh, one athlete will be attacking another one with a throw. And on the ground, every 12 seconds, an athlete will be attacking another one 
uh, in within the 210 pound class in Nawaza. In in the in the weight classes above 210, every 13.2 seconds, a bit slower tempo, not exceedingly slower, but a bit slower. Every 13.2 seconds, we are seeing one athlete try to attack another one with a throw, uh, in in a heavy, anything over 210. Okay, and in the 210 and over 210 pound class, every 15.5 seconds there will be a, a meaningful nawaza or ground fighting attack, either arm lock, pin, or choke, okay? Um, and overall, when we're looking at percentage of throws, percentage of ground fighting moves, and percentage of decisions or point wins, uh, the spread is kind of really interesting to me. Um, in all the matches that I've looked at, 40% of the time, there is a win by a throwing technique. That means a um, any pawn, pretty much, okay? Or it could be a, a total point spread where they were all throws, okay? Uh, it could be, you know, like where you have an opponent, you know, keep getting, getting four-point throws uh, or, you know, big throws like that. But generally, I think, and I would say all of these, my stats here would be primarily to be a pawns. So 40% of the matches will score any pawn, from a throw. Okay. We can say that with some clarity. 36% of the time, there will be an pawn scored with a ground fighting technique. That would be either an arm lock or a strangle. Okay. Either Kensetsu Waza or Shime Waza. And so 36% of the time, now of that's 36% of the time, 38% of the time is a strangle, a Shime Waza. Okay. A choking technique. 62% of the time will be an arm lock. If, if, if an opponent is scored in a match in AAU freestyle judo on the ground, 62% of the time uh, it will be an arm lock, and 38% uh, of the time it will be a strangle. Now, 24% of the matches ended either in a decision uh, or a 12-point spread, Okay, where one, one athlete had 12 more points than the other. Okay, So that... And we, we counted those all in a decision win format. So 40% of the time, any pawn from a throw was scored. 36% of the time, and a pawn from a ground fighting technique, either an arm lock or a strangle was scored. And in 24% of the time, a decision win was scored. Okay, so that's how it breaks down into the percentage of wins, uh, you know, uh, standing ground and decisions or point spreads. Okay, let's look at the most popular throws, okay? Um, and I'll go over these quickly, all right? And the top, now remember, also in freestyle judo, we allow leg grabs. So we can allow Morote Gari, Ashidori, Katagaruma, that type of thing. Um, as long, the, the rules are very specific. You have to have, have grip of your opponent first, both hands initially, and then I can attack. Don't just shoot in like a wrestler. You know, no, no drop and shoot or, you know, anything like that. So you have to have a good grip first before you initiate your throwing attack. Um, and that's a rule we use in freestyle judo. And that really does cut down the amount of people trying to drop in and throw, like in, in making wrestling. So we want to keep it very much judo. So keep that in mind when I'm reading these statistics to you that some of the throws we use, like in IJF, the, you, you can't touch anything with your hands, anything below his waist. At least that's the current rules now as of 2015. So um, at least that's to my understanding. But in freestyle judo, AAU judo, we allow that. And even in the AAU judo rules, not just freestyle rules, the regular rules, we allow that as well. So that being said, the most popular, the most often scored throw in freestyle AAU judo is osotogari or slash osotogaki. Major outer reap or major outer hook could be crossbody osotogari, sometimes referred to as osotogaki. Uh, so Osotogari, uh, one of the very first throws we teach the beginners, isn't it? Uh, certainly in my case, um, it's one of the classic throws of judo. Hey, it stood the test of time. Still a great throw. Number one. Okay. And number one by quite a bit. Very popular throw. The next most popular, number two, is Uchimata. Another classic throw. Uchimata, inner thigh throw. Number two. Number three. Any form of Sayanagi, now I counted them all together, could be knee drop Sayanagi or standing Sayanagi, we see both. Uh, primarily, though, these were from knee drop Sayanagi attacks, okay? Uh, I would say 
again, I don't have the stats right here in front of me, but I did parse them out and I forgot to really put them here. But I would say 80% at least, if not more, of those Soyanagi attacks were of the knee drop variety, the double knee drop variety. Okay, very aggressive. Not just flop and drop, but a meaningful attack where you tried to break the balance. So number three, Soyanagi. Uh, either Morote or Ipon Soyanagi. I lumped them together. All right. Number four, Uranagi, rear throw. That also includes any related lifting throw, like a thigh lift or uh, what's commonly referred to in judo circles as a carborelli, and any, any type of a thigh sweep or, or knee lift throw where you would lift like we do in Sambo, from my Sambo background, where we lift them up and throw them over our hips. Uh, any type of throw like that is considered lumped together in uranagi or rear throw. Okay, so number four, it isn't just, by the way, isn't just as a, uh, a, a counter technique. It is a very aggressive move. We did see it a lot as counters. Yes, very popular counter, but we saw that really as an aggressive move just as often. And so Uranagi, number four. Number five, Harai Goshi, another classic throw. Harai Goshi, number five. Number six, Morote Gari, both hands reap, double leg takedown, double leg throw, <clears throat> Morote Gari. Again, freestyle judo, we see it. You won't see it in IJF. So if you're an IJF guy uh, and try, you know, looking at this, uh, count that out, but we sort of see it. And again, not just drop and shoot. These are meaningful attacks, trying to throw them for pawn. We saw a lot of pawn scored with Morote Gari too. Very, very good throw. Next is Suri Goshi or lifting hip throw. Don't confuse that with Suri Komi Goshi or lifting pulling hip throw. It is a different throw. It is where you grab around the waist, grab around the, the back in a back grip or a monster grip, and you're grabbing his belt or jacket tossing him over your hip, throwing him over your hip. Surigoshi. Very similar throw. That was number seven. Number seven, Very similar throw was number eight. Koshigaruma, hip wheel. We see that a lot in the kids, but again, my stats are all with adults. We saw that a lot with the adult men too. Koshigaruma, even though it's considered one of the very basic throws of judo, is still a very good competitive judo technique. So Koshigaruma. Um, you'll see Ogoshi a little later in the list too, by the way. The next one is Kouchigari or Kouchigaki, or Kouchi Makakomi. Kouchigari, minor inner reap. Kouchigaki, minor inner hook. Kouchi Makakomi, minor inner winding or sacrificing type throw, wrapping throw. Uh, those are all together. The Kouchi series. Uh, that is number nine. Okay. Number 10, another pickup throw. Tegaruma, hand wheel. Some people call it Sukuinagi. This is where my, my I could attack my opponent aggressively, or he may attack me, I counter, and I'll lift him up and throw him uh, in a tegaruma type moving movement. That is number 10, a tegaruma. Number 11 is sume geishi, or corner counter throw. That's a number the 11th most often scored throw we see in my stats is sume geishi. Number 12 is ouchigari, another basic fundamental throw of judo. Major inner reap, ouchigari, number 12. Number 13 is tomoa nagi. Tomoanagi. And we saw both the straight in Tomoanagi, the very basic core st style of doing Tomoanagi, uh, straight Tomoanagi, or spinning Tomoanagi, or skip in Tomoanagi, as it's called Yoko Tomoanagi or Tobi Tomoanagi, whichever your preference and terminology is. But that is lumped in together. So any type of a Tomoanagi throw is number 13. Number 14 are the foot sweeps we saw, the Ashibarai, the advancing foot sweep, or Okuri Ashibarai, the send after sliding foot sweep. Um, we saw those as the number 14. I put those together because it's it's kind of hard to really define which happens that quickly. And um, But it, again, I lumped them in together, but basically a good clean foot sweep was number 14. So that is still good standard classic judo is still out there. An interesting number 15 right behind that and we saw this a lot in the heavier guys, believe it or not, is Sasai Sudakomiyashi, propping, drawing, ankle throw, or the propping, drawing, foot throw. And that was number 14, or 15, I'm sorry, number 15 was Sasai Sudakomiyashi. Number 16 was Soto Makakomi, the outer winding throw, big movement throwing. We saw that number 16. Number 17, again, a leg grab was Ashi Dori, leg grab. Ashi means leg, Dori. Uh, means grab, leg grab, ashidori. Um, that also includes the ankle picks, 
we saw where one athlete might be attempting an uchimata, and he reaches down, he scoops the ankle, does a knee block, that type of thing. That And the score came from that ashidori, from that leg grab. Might have started as uchimata, might end up as ashidori. Could have been straight in from a grip to an ashidori. That happened as well, or ankle pick. So ashidori, number 17. Number 18, we kind of had three throws together. We had kosodagari, minor outer reaping throw, or the switch, which was could be construed as a kosodo type movement where you fake forward and you kind of switch. You do a thigh sweep or a, a rear foot sweep of some type. Or it could, it could be you shoot your leg so far back. It is also a Tani Otoshi. So we have number nine, uh, number 18, kind of a com, com, combination of Kosoto Gari, of a switch of what's called the Kosoto switch or the, uh, the twitch, the British call it, or Tani Otoshi, where it's you know, you maybe fake forward and throw them to the rear as an aggressive movement. Uh, we didn't see so many Tani Otoshis as defensive movements, although it's a popular move, I'm sure. But we, in my stats, I tended to see more of an aggressive movement. So number 19 is, or number 18 is more of a Kosodagari switch Tani Otoshi. Okay, so that's number 19. Or number 18, I keep going to number 19. Number 19, I keep looking, is Ogoshi, major hip throw. Good old-fashioned basic throw, Ogoshi, one of the core throws of judo. And the 20th most often used throw that we see uh, is Kosodagaki minor outer hook. And interestingly, we didn't see a lot of katagurumas. I thought when I was looking at this and studying this and looking over my notes and compiling them, I thought I'd see katagurumo more often. And I didn't see it that often. I saw a little bit of it, but not enough to get in the top 20. Okay, so, but we did see kosodogaki minor outer hook, where you hooking in a, you know, outside leg hook, that type of thing. That was number 20. So, and uh, both as an aggressive move as a counter, it was sometimes used as a counter, but more often not as an aggressive move. So those are the top 20 most often used throws that actually garnered scores or gained scores in AAU freestyle judo. Now, as far as submission techniques and ground fighting, they was a, um, overall the most often ground fighting moves combined the top seven, okay, that we saw most often used were number one, Munigatami, chest hold. Don't confuse that with Keisugatami. Don't confuse that with Yoko Shihogatami. Side, it, the, the Munigatami is separate in and of itself as a chest hold. Okay, so Munigatami number one. Number two, Jujigatami. Dear to my heart, I love seeing this. We saw Jujigatami crossbody arm lock as the second most often used move in ground fighting and freestyle AAU judo. Uh, number three was Keisugatami, good old fashioned scarf hold. Again, one of the basic moves, Kesagatami, number thir the third most popular, most often used move to gain points or you know to, to use in freestyle AAU judo. Number four was Ude Garami, arm entanglement, or the bent arm lock. Okay, if you're a BGJ person or MMA guy, it's the Kimura. Okay, and um, that's the most fourth most popular used move. And, and overall in the ground fighting and freestyle judo. Number five, again, back to basics, Hadaka Jime, the rear naked choke. All right. But I, I also, Hadaka Jime, not just the rear naked choke, as a front choke too. So we'll also see that as a guillotine because you they weren't using the gi, they were using a front naked choke or a rear naked choke. They're combined. So Hadaka Jime, the naked Hadaka, no clothing, you know, no, no gi. Jime means to squeeze together, to strangle, basically. So uh, the naked choke, that is the guillotine, uh, the rear naked choke using the, there we go, the Hadaka Jime, the figure four, or not the figure four, the, the square grip, or the figure four Hadaka Jime. We saw that as well. So those are three lumped together, but they were all Hadaka Jime, okay? That's the uh, fifth most popular scoring move. Uh, number six was Kamishi Hogatami, upper four corner hold. Very, very popular. And the seventh most scored move was the a lapel strangle. And from the front, interestingly, not from, not from the back, like a Okurdiari Jame or something like that. It was from the front, a lot of front attacks. And we saw a lot of that coming out of after one athlete held the other, say generally in the upper four corner hold or some kind of a side hold position, he worked into a lapel strangle from the front position. You know, for, for after getting his four points for Osaikomi. So uh, we saw this 
often. So a lapel strangle from the front. Now, the, the, the top seven scoring hold downs, or Osaikomi Waza, were number one, Munigatami, chest hold. Number two, Keisugatami, scarf hold. Number three, Kamishi Hogatami, upper four corner hold. Number four, Tate Shihogatami, the vertical four corner hold, or the mount, okay, the, but as a hold. Okay, number five, Yoko Shihogatami, side four corner hold, okay, separate from Munigatami, all right? Number six, Katagatami, shoulder hold, which often led into some type of a kata jime, which you will we'll talk about this momentarily, a shoulder choke or head and arm choke, okay? So that was number six, kata jime, very popular hold. Number seven, ukigatami. Uki means to straddle. In this case, straddle. Gatami means to hold in place. A straddle hold. Um, the knee on belly, okay? A knee on belly or a cross, leg, leg across the belly, leg across the torso. So ukigatami was the seventh most popular one used in osaikomi or holding or time holds, okay? The, the most top seven scoring submissions, and I just kept seven, seven's a good, seven was, I just kept seven for some, sorry, could have been 10, but I just did seven. Um, the top scoring submission techniques that scored really the most pawns. Jujigatami, cross body arm lock. Again, I wrote a whole book on it. I love to see this. It's great. Jujigatami, the guys are doing it. Thank you. Okay. Number two, Udigarami, another arm lock. And again, looking back to stats, what do we say? 62% of the pawns scored by ground fighting were arm locks. Well, here we go. The top two pawns were scored Jujigatami, Udigarami, and submissions, okay? Arm and arm entanglement, bent arm lock, Kimura, Udigarami, arm entanglement. That's number two. Number three, Hadaka Jime, the rear naked choke or the naked choke, not just the rear, but a, a guillotine uh, or a rear attack with a choke, okay? Hadaka Jime, naked strangle. Uh, number four, some type of lapel strangle, Eri Jime, lapel strangle from the front, okay? So a lapel strangle from the front was the fourth most scored with, most often used submission technique. Number five was kata jime, shoulder choke, or the head and arm, okay? Uh, the arm triangle, all right, if you wish. But the kata jime, the shoulder choke, was number five. Uh, number six was the triangle choke, sankaku jime, or sangaku jime, your preference. Sankaku jime was number six most popular uh, attacking uh, uh, submission. And number seven, was Ure Gatami, the straight arm lock. Again, a very basic um, judo technique or sambo technique or grappling technique in general. Ure Gatami. Ure means arm. Gatami means to lock in place. So basically, it's the straight arm lock. That was the seventh most popular move. So there we have it, The some statistics on what I've been keeping for a number of years since 2009. It's now 2015, like I said before. Uh, so these are stats I hope you can use and, and use to help your own training. Uh, either if you're a coach, you're your athletes, you can look at these stats and say, hey, these are, you know, these are what's happening out there. And you can, or if you're an athlete, use them for yourself. In my weight class, how often do these guys attack? Well, review the video here that I'm doing and, and, and see how often. What's the most commonly used move? Well, I have to defend, if I'm on the ground, I guess they're going to be trying Jujigatami on me a lot. Guess what? Or... Uh, they're going to be breaking me down, trying to do the chest hole, munigatami on me. So you you can use this for your training. And uh, but but I like statistics because, like I said, as a young coach, I got in the habit of doing it. Now that I'm an old coach, I'm still in the habit of using these. And I hope you get in the habit of using statistics because they give you a better feel, a better idea of what's actually happening in a contest. It's not just a matter of guesswork or I, this is what I like to do because my sensei taught me to do this. If I want to coach athletes to win matches, I want to see what's being done by my opposition and, and what's being done by, well, in the sport in general, what are the general trends? And now with these, with this information, you can use this to better coach your athletes if you're a coach or to use it for your own benefit if you're an athlete. So anyway, uh, again, Mark Twain said there are lies, damn lies, and statistics, but uh, these aren't lies or damn lies. They're statistics, and uh, hopefully you can use them to your benefit. And if nothing else, it's been a whole lot of fun for me to keep them because I just kind of like doing this stuff.
So uh, until the next issue or the next episode, I will see you and stay safe in training and uh, see you later.